so okay, this part is more about the data integration. So it was a question this morning uh, about how then we integrate the different experiments, different data types. So I first show you how we generate these present types and calls, and now how we do this overall integration between all these experiments and data types. So I presented you this part of the pipeline, and now I will more focus on these two last steps of, of the pipeline. Um, okay, so an important aspect uh, of our work in BG is not only about the analysis that I presented, uh, it's about the expert curation. So Mark told you a lot about that, uh, about how we uh, do quality controls, annotate the data, each sample manually, uh, and I'm, I'm going to, to tell you again a bit about that. Uh, okay, so as Mark said this morning, uh, each and every sample in BG, we annotate it uh, to anatomical entity, developmental and life stage, sex and strain. So when we say that we know the conditions where a gene is expressed, it will be that. We can know where a gene is expressed regarding the organs, the developmental stage, the sex and the strains. The other aspect of gene expression, we do not capture yet, but that could be easily extended. That could be extended to capture uh, physiological conditions or, or environmental conditions. Uh, but, but then, then it depends on the amount of work needed or so to perform these annotations. <clears throat> so these are, uh, okay, I just throw a bunch of numbers here. Uh, so you get the different data types in BG, RLSC, Caffeymetrix, in situ, EST. Here you have number of samples, number of experiments, and the number of conditions that are annotated. So for instance, for RNSC data, uh, we will have about 600 different uh, organs that have been sampled. But in in situ stabilization data, we will have 6,000. So because it gets very, very detailed, so it can get to the cell level resolution. So this is why we value this kind of data. It's low throughput, it's not a lot of gene at the same time, but it's a very fine, very detailed. Um, so yeah, from our RNC data, we will have on average, about only 20 organs per species. While here, if we're in situ, we'll have an average more than a thousand organs. So there are large differences like that. But basically, if we look only at the high throughput method, Affymetrix and RNA-seq, so we have data in 1,000 organs uh, in the different species. So that would make like, on average, 35 organs per species. And if you mix that with the developmental stage, we have like, about 4,000 organ stage. So that will make like, what? 100 per, per species on average, more than 100 on average per species, for which we have kind of the complete uh, genome expression. Um, so as Mark said, we focus only on healthy wild types. So it means no abnormal genetic background, no disease, no gene knockouts, no treatments not expected in the wild. Uh, that's kind of hard sometimes to define. So we have the example of fasting time, for instance. So we have experiments where they conducted fasting of mice, for instance. And at which point, after how, how long does it become to be not normal? Because of course, individuals in the wild, they experience fasting from time to time. So is 12 hours a correct fasting time? Is one week? A correct fasting time. So we have to, yeah, to 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 draw lines in the sand at some point to say, okay, this is something we do not consider normal. This is something we do consider normal. So we have guidelines uh, that you can find uh, that I will put maybe in the Google Doc. Uh, Patricia, can you add a note, please, in the Google Notes for me to share the the, the criteria we have? But we have a clear set of criteria. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so we check a lot the information consistency. I will give you a few examples of how deep we go into digging into the papers to, to, to be sure that the data are high quality because we are a secondary database. We are not a primary database such as SRA, which has to accept everything. We can be picky. So we will take only the highest quality uh, of the data available. 
And so we perform quality control and we also did something that are kind of unusual usually in primary repository that for instance, we remove hidden redundancy. So for instance, we have identified that in our affinity data sets in the first place, there were as much as 14% of the samples that were duplicated, meaning a sample was reused in different experiments or an experiment was fully duplicated uh, as part as another experiment, that sort of things. Uh, so we developed methods to identify that and remove this uh, redundant data points because for us it's important so that we don't count twice. Uh, we don't consider as two individual, uh, two independent experiments, uh, a same experiment giving us the same information. Uh, so for RNSC, for instance, we we generate the, we use FastQC for the quality control, and then we'll do density plot of the TPM values for checking whether the distribution of expression values uh, is in an acceptable uh, uh, range. Uh, we will also check the, the TPM values, the, the counts of, of reads aligned. So if, an, if in a library we get only, I don't know, that happens actually, in the library we get only a few thousand reads that could be mapped. Obviously there was something wrong with this library. So we will check that sort of things and the idea is that we are very picky in BG. The data you will find in BG are only of the highest quality. Uh, for our metrics data, we actually uh, develop our own quality metrics uh, that, of course, I'm going to say that in a very objective way, that outperform every existing quality control method, which is called AQRA, uh, which is published. Uh, so we will use that quality score if we have access to the raw cell files. If we have access only to the process mass file files, we will have uh, metrics such as the percentage of genes uh, considered as present. So for each chip type, we have defined minimum percentage of genes present uh, that for us to accept these chips. So for instance, if on a chip we have only 5% of the genes that are considered present, there is something fishy because a cell cannot function with only 5% of the gene expressed. Um, okay, so for in-situ abilization data, we rely on the information from the model organism databases. So the in-situ abilization, they are annotated uh, by model organism databases such as uh, ZFIM or WarmBase. So we rely on their expert curation, uh, but also for with some of them, we have an ongoing collaboration. So with WarmBase for C elegance, we have a collaboration with them for annotating Affymetrix and bulk RNAC data. And so in BG, we will focus on the healthy wild type while they also annotate the gene knockouts and the virus treatments. Uh, so just to show you an example of the kind of curation we do to check whether the data are really good. So here it's an example uh, of, a, of an experiment, uh, Affymetrix experiment in GEO. And here you get the list of the samples available that you could retrieve. And you get basic information attached to each sample. And for instance, there was a replicate here. For this sample, they say that uh, it was in Macaca, they said that the individual was 6.5 year old. But then the same replicate, so for which they get a different tissue, uh, they say a different age. So the same individual is assigned two different ages uh, in this experiment. So obviously there's something fishy. So we are just going to discard both samples. So either we try to contact the authors, but if we get no answer, we just discard the sample. Um, another, another example here, it's, it's in SRA. Uh, so here it was in the supplementary data. It was not like that on the website. So when you look at the supplementary data, you get the sample names here, and they had two columns that were source name and tissue. And for source name, you see here it was Lungissimus dorsi. You get uh, consistent, it's consistent between the two columns, but here, for the same information of tissue, it's a different source name, multiple muscle tissue. Doesn't fit longissimus dorsi. So again, here, we will contact the authors, but if we cannot, oh, I need to plug my laptop, sorry. 
But yeah, if we don't get the information or if, we, if the information is suspicious, we'll just discard the sample. Uh, here, and again, a last example. Uh, so an experiment in the geo uh, with different samples. And we have this sample that is available from the geo interface with no further information. But when we, you, you go back to the paper, in the supplementary data of the paper, this sample, there were these little stars here, and these stars say that are removed because sample was an outlier. So it means the authors discarded this sample, but they had to submit it to GEO because they have to. Uh, it's part of the guidelines of most journals that you have to submit all your data. So they submit all the data they are available, and if you use them like that from GEO, you will not be aware of that. So we do that kind of work to go back to the publication and check each and every sample. This is why it takes so much time. This is why you need a human to do it. This is why it cannot be done automatically. Because here you can see the format is obviously not standardized. So yeah, you need a human to do that. And the work of curators is really valuable. Uh, here we have an example. Uh, also that will be the, my last example of how picky we are. Uh, it was uh, an Affymetrix data set of uh, human placenta samples. And so here you have value of our quality score that I mentioned, IQRA. And here it was a correlation to the reference. So from all the placenta samples, we build a, an average gene expression. And there we were comparing the correlation of individual samples to this average reference. So this is what we call correlation to reference. And you see that there is a clear correlation. The better the correlation to the reference is, the higher the quality score is. And so here, for instance, you have a low quality sample, which show a low correlation to the average of the human placenta samples. But here we had one outlier, a high quality score, but a poor correlation to the, to the reference. So we went back to the data, to the paper, and we realized that this sample instead of being placenta, it was decidua, which is not wrong because decidua is a substructure of placenta. So it was not wrong, it was placenta, but it was just not all placenta, it was a substructure. And you can actually see it in the data. It's obvious from the gene expression that it was not the full placenta. So we went back and we reannotated this sample. So this is the kind of analysis that is very hard to, to create all kind of tests that will manage everything. Again, we have manual annotation and it's really needed to have high quality expression data. So Mark showed you this, uh, uh, this slide this morning. It was about the annotation of the GTEC dataset. Uh, GTEC dataset, so it was uh, the version six, it was about 11,000 samples from 200 donors, something like that. And you can see that we kept only a half of the sample. So each and every sample, we went back manually through it. We review for each donor, whether the donor, it could be acceptable or not, or whether we should uh, selectively discard some samples, or whether we could accept everything. And so we reviewed manually these 11,000 samples and kept only about half of them. Uh, okay, so that's the part about the creation. Um, yeah, so it's a lot of work. Each sample, we map that to anatomical ontology, developmental stage ontology, uh, sex vocabulary, strain vocabulary. We have to harmonize the strain names because it's not harmonized in the literature. So all this kind of work, it's, yeah, it's very, it's about being picky and the work of curator, it's all about having a, a mind state of being very precise and, and focused. Um, okay, so with this annotation, we are able to know the conditions where genes are expressed. So we get the statistical analysis to detect expression, but we have the curation to know where and when. So, now what I'm going to present is that, okay, we have the conditions, we have the codes. How do we make sense of all of that? How do we integrate all of that? Uh, so a um, first important thing that we do is that we do what we call propagating 
the present absent expression cause. So I will give you an example of what it means. So as I said, we use ontologies to uh, annotate our data. And it's very useful ontologies because as Mark said, you have relations between the terms. So for instance, here, this is just a small part of the anatomical ontology we use. You have terms such as pancreas. In the pancreas, you have the endocrine pancreas, endocrine, okay, I will stick to endocrine. Uh, exocrine, okay, I will say crine. So you have the endocrine and exocrine pancreas that are both part of the pancreas. And we also use dermatal stage ontology. So you have, for instance, the sexually immature stage, which is part of the fully formed stage. So the names are a bit weird, but it's because it needs to accommodate any species. So you have this ontology. Now we have these gene expression codes. We have a gene here that is said to be present in the exocrine pancreas at sexually immature stage. We have this gene present in the endocrine pancreas at this stage, and we have this gene absent from pancreas at the fully formed stage. So we can see that the data they come from, they were annotated at different levels. We, we didn't get, in the case of, of this gene, we didn't get the information of the precise subpart of pancreas. We just knew it was pancreas, or maybe it was the whole pancreas mixed in. And the developmental stage, we didn't get more information that the organism was mature. It was not an embryo. This is all the information we get. And for these genes here, sexually mature, we just know that. It was not an embryo. It was not a sexually mature individual. We don't know more. So we get that. So that could be represented like that here you will have a graph of condition. So you will say, for instance, that exocrine pancreas as sexually immature, it is a subcondition of pancreas at sexually immature, which is a subcondition of pancreas at fully formed. So I hope this is clear, but basically from the individual ontologies, we can recreate kind of an ontology of conditions. So mixing up the relation between the organs and between the developmental stage. And here, so in this condition, you will get expression of the first gene. In this condition, you will get expression of the second gene. And in this condition, you will get absence of expression of this gene. So if you look at the data like that, you see that there is no condition where we have information for all of the genes. We cannot do comparison, we cannot integrate. So what we do is that we are going to propagate this present absent expression cause in the graph of conditions. So that after propagation, you will get something like that. So what we do is that the present expression codes, we propagate them to all parent uh, terms. So for instance, if you say that a gene is expressed in the endocrine pancreas, it means that it is expressed in the pancreas. Or in the same way, if you have a gene expressed, I don't know, in a hippocamp, it means that the gene is expressed in the brain. It means that the gene is expressed in the nervous system. It means that the uh, gene is expressed in the organism. So we can propagate like that all present expression codes to all parent conditions. And for the absent ex expression codes, if you say, for instance, that a gene is not expressed in the brain, then can you say that it is expressed nowhere in the brain? I mean, because maybe it's expressed in just a small group of cells in the brain, and you will miss that. But still, we consider that we can propagate absence of expression to uh, the children, to the child conditions, but just one level down. So if we say that a gene is not expressed in pancreas, we will propagate this absence of expression one level down to exocrine pancreas and endocrine pancreas. So basically, in this case, it means that this absence of expression, we have propagated here in endocrine pancreas at fully formed. We do not propagate uh, absent code using the developmental stage. We use only the anatomy. So if I rephrase, present expression codes, we propagate to all parent conditions, to so parent organs, parent stages. Absent expression codes, we propagate one level down for the anatomy. We do not propagate for the developmental stage because Obviously, we have not samples each and every developmental stage. While an organ, we 
might have take the full organ and crush it and look at the expression of the full organ, so including all the substructures. So this absence of expression of this gene here, we will propagate the absence of expression here in the endocrine pancreas fully formed, in the exocrine pancreas fully formed. And the presence of expression from this gene, we will propagate to all parent condition, for this gene to all parent condition. At the end, what you can see here, after propagation, we have information for the three genes. We know that the first gene is expressed in the pancreas at fully form, that the second gene is expressed in pancreas at fully form, and that the third gene is not expressed in pancreas at fully form. So from these calls unpropagated, we will get these calls propagated. Much more information that is not now become comparable. So this is a first level of integration. How do we compare between different conditions in different experiments? We do this propagation so that then we can arrive at comparable conditions where the data for different genes are integrated. So this is the first level of integration. I want to mention that this anatomical ontology we use, well, it's very smart. I love it. Uh, I think so we are part of the developer, but the guys who did this machinery, they are ontology specialists. And I want to show you how useful it is to use a good ontology. So here, for instance, it is an example of the olfactory tubercle in Mars. Uh, so the olfactory tubercle, so okay, you have a structure called Islands of Calera. And the structure Islands of Calera, it is part of the olfactory tubercle in Mars. But in primates, the islands of Calera is part of the nucleus accumbens. It's not part of the olfactory tubercle. So you have a same anatomical structure, which is not organized in the same way in different species. It does not belong to the same structure in different species. So how can you capture that in an ontology? So you have mechanism to say in Mars, islands of Calera is part of olfactory tubercle, not part of nucleus accumbens. And in primates, including human, it's part of nucleus accumbens. So ontologies, they allow to do that. Uh, so I just show you how it is done, but you don't care so much. But here, it's a format called OBO, and you can see so for this term, island of Calera, you get a relationship part of to the nucleus accumbens, which is valid only in this taxon, with a taxon identifier. And in mouse, it's part of olfactory tubercles. So you have rodents here that is targeted by this relation. So this is in obo format. This is in Manchester syntax, but it's same, the same thing. Island of Calera, in primates, it's part of nucleus accumbens. Island of Calera, in rodentia, it's part of olfactory tubercles. So we have these different kind of relations, depending on the taxon. And we use this relation accordingly when we propagate the codes. So in human, you will not propagate expression in islands of Calera. You will not propagate that to olfactory tubercle, but to nucleus accumbens. So we can be very precise, uh, thanks to ontology. So I want to stress how much it is important to use ontologies when you annotate your data and not use any vocabulary or not use free text, because then you can do these kind of things, which is quite amazing, in my opinion. Um, so then Mark got this question, uh, how do we reconcile between uh, individual calls um, of different experiments? So let's say, for instance, you have two experiments to doing the same condition, and, and then, um, okay, so that would be more, okay. Uh, for instance, let's say that you have expression in pancreas, uh, of a gene at adult stage, but you have absence of expression in pancreas at embryo stage. So that would be a first level of discrepancy between different conditions. So we will say in BG that present calls always win. So in that case, if you ask for expression in pancreas at any developmental stage, we will tell you, okay, this gene is expressed in pancreas. But then, if you ask specifically for pancreas at embryo stage, we will tell you, oh, we have no conflicting data at this stage. 
which is absent. So this is how we do. We present always win kind of way. Uh, we could have a different case where we have two experiments to be in the same condition. And one might say present and the other experiment might say absent. Again, present is going to win. So this is why it's important for us to correct for our FDR. Uh, and, but it also makes sense anyway, because maybe in one experiment, you, you didn't get the same environmental conditions. And we just didn't capture that in our annotation because we are limited in what we can capture. So again, it's just a matter of the level of details you go into. So again, if it's just pancreas, well, then it's expressed. If it's pancreas during night, well, then maybe it's absent, but we didn't capture this information. We can just go as far as we can. Um, okay. Yeah, okay, I said all of that. Um, okay, so it's a bunch of text, I apologize, but then uh, just to tell you that we also compute a confidence level. So as I said, this is the top of the slide. For individual calls, we have two quality levels, low and high. But then we are going to aggregate these different samples, different experiments in the same condition together. So here we are going to uh, compute a confidence level for the call. So if in the same conditions we have two individual experiments, two independent experiments, giving us the same information, we are going to say that we are highly confident about this data and we are going to call that goal confidence. If we have only one experiment giving a call of high quality or two experiments giving a call of low quality, we are going to call that silver confidence. And if we have only one experiment giving a call of low quality, we are going to call that bronze confidence. So we have these three levels of confidence from the aggregation based on the number of experiments supporting the call, gold, silver, bronze. Because for us, it makes sense that, yeah, if you get confirmation from individual experiments, then you can start being, uh, you can start trusting this information. Uh, so again, here it's the same information for absent calls. It means that we will have uh, two individual experiments telling us that the gene is expressed with absolutely no contradictory information, even in the substructures. So when BG tells you that the gene is absent with a gold quality, it means that it has been verified by independent experiments and nowhere in the condition, even in substructures, there is expression detected. So when BG tells you it's absent, it's, it's really reliable uh, because we are, yeah, we are very picky about absent because it's very hard to say that something that is not there is not there. It's very, yeah, it's very difficult. So we are very picky about that. Okay, so uh, you see how now we can integrate different conditions, different experiments. And this is because we have these calls. We have this qualitative information that is comparable between data types, between experiments. So it's very, very useful. But you miss uh, a quantitative information. You, you want to know how high Ideally, your gene is expressed. And the calls, they don't give you that. It's a limitation. So to overcome this limitation, we have developed what we call expression ranks. Uh, so yeah, expression ranks, uh, it's a way to, to evaluate the expression levels. But obviously, between different data types, you cannot just compare the expression values. How are you going to compare uh, the signal intensity of prop sets in Affymetrix and of TPM values in our seq experiments, you cannot. So what we did is that we developed a non-parametric statistics based on ranks. So for each data type, we are going to compute a rank based on expression data. And then we are going to normalize these ranks between data types and conditions to make them all comparable. And that will allow us to give you uh, a value uh, for the expression intensity. I, I will give you examples, uh, but I will just briefly show you the step for RNA-seq because it's the easier. So for RNA-seq, first we take uh, each library and we rank the genes based on their TPM values and we do a fractional ranking. 
And then for each gene in a condition, we compute a weighted mean over all the libraries available in this condition. So it's a weighted mean, we weight that uh, by some parameters, it's not important, but basically we weight by the uh, informativity of each library. So uh, the more a library allows to distinguish expression of genes, uh, the more weight we give to these libraries. So it means that at this step, from our analytic data in each condition, you get a mean of the ranks of all genes studied in that condition. And then uh, we store some parameter that will allow us to normalize between data types and conditions. But, but that's it for our analytic. We rank the genes per library and we average that in each condition. That's it, very simple for our analytic. Uh, we also do that for our metrics, but for our metrics, we will first normalize uh, between different chip types because different chip types have not the same genes on the chip. So you don't, uh, you will have, for instance, uh, 5,000 genes on a chip or 10,000 genes on another chip. So we normalize that so that the ranks on every chip are comparable. Uh, I give you an example for in situ abilization. In situ abilization is very hard because it's not quantitative, it's just staining areas on a picture. Uh, that will have been annotated by, by curator. So we just have the information, this gene is expressing brain, for instance. So how could you get quantitative information from that? So what we thought is that uh, the more often an expression information is reported in a database, uh, the more biologically important this expression is. So for instance, for, I don't know, DLX gene in members uh, during embryonic development, you have hundreds of evidence showing that because it's essential in lead developments uh, and so it's really often reported so what we did is that we just assign a score to each evidence reporting present high present low absent low absent high we assign a score to each of these evidence and then we sum the evidence we sum the scores and we rank genes in each conditions based on this score and it's actually working. I mean, so it does not allow to very finely distinguish gene expression, but it actually works. We have genes with only in situ abilization data, and the ranking of conditions makes sense considering the known biology of the gene. But again, we will normalize the ranks between data types so that in situ abilization data will not mess up RNA seq uh, gene expression ranks. Uh, and for EST, it's pretty much the same. We will pull all ESTs in a condition and count the number of ESTs for each gene and rank the genes based on that. Uh, okay, and then we will have a normalization between all data types. So what we will do is that we will look at the maximum rank in a given species, and in each condition, we will look at the maximum rank in that condition from a specific data type. And then we will normalize the rank of the genes in the conditions from the data type as compared to this maximum rank in the species over all data types. So I just throw a formula here, but that's just the basic idea. So for each data type in each condition, we do a rank, we average that, and we normalize between all conditions and data types so that it's comparable. Uh, well, yeah, and then at the end, we do a global mean over all the data types. That's just the formula, but strictly don't care, but each data type, there is a weight uh, assigned to the data type based on the data that were available, so that you will give basically more weight to our uh, rather than to in situ abilization if you get information from both data types. And so at the end of the day, BG gives you for each gene in each condition that has been studied, a score to tell you how high it is expressed. Uh, and then, yeah, just to mention, uh, so that's rank, but it's really non-intuitive. Users uh, often ask questions about that because the higher the expression is, the lower the rank is. So this is counterintuitive. When you look at the value, uh, you, you see a, a small value and correspond to a high expression that's messing up. 
So we translate this strength into what we call an expression score. So an expression score is normalized between zero to 100. So it's very clear you don't have values outside of this range. And the higher the expression score is, the higher the expression is. So it's more intuitive. Uh, and so I will show you, uh, I think I should stop soon. Okay, so just to finish, I show you an example of what we do with that. So Mark is going next to present to you in more details the tool we use, but I will show you how we use these scores and ranks on our gene page on our website. So I give you the example of one gene, uh, the gene APOC1, uh, which is a nalipoprotein gene, which is used in liver mostly. Uh, and you can see that liver is a top ranked, ranked conditions in human. So this is the rank score, normalized, weighted. We have affinitrix data and a relative data that has been used together. And we have this expression score, which is really, really high. What is interesting is that you can see that the expression is actually high in a lot of other tissues. This gene is expressing more than 200 organs and highly expressed in most of them. This is often surprising because in literature, you will see that authors, they put forward the condition where gene is important and they don't speak about the other conditions. But actually, most genes are expressed in lots of conditions, even where they are not supposed to have a function. That, that's a bit disturbing. So you can see that this gene is highly expressed in lots of tissues, but still BG managed to identify the condition where this gene is essential. I mean, where this gene is the most highly expressed. From different data types, you get affinitrix here. Here, you don't get affinitrix data, but still, it go blends in together. And then you get this gene, these autologous genes in other species. And I show you here, I know seven other species, uh, from primates to rodents to fish. And you can see that every time the top ranked condition is liver. And that can come from here, for zebrafish, you even get in situ hybridization data. For these species, you get only RNAC. Uh, here you get asymmetrics. Do I have something else? Yeah, you get only asymmetrics here, RNAC here. So we managed to take all these data from different data types and different species all together, and we give you one single answer to the question, where is my gene expressed? And this answer makes sense because it's ranking by our expression score. Uh, okay, so that's it for this presentation. Uh, so in summary, to know the conditions where genes are expressed, we annotate anatomy, development, sex, strengths. We have very stringent filtering of the data from manual curation and quality controls. We are picky, we are a secondary database. We keep only the highest quality possible. We integrate all this data by, the data by generating present absent expression codes, by propagating and reconciling these codes, and by computing expression ranks and expression scores. And if you want to look at all of that in details, uh, the source code of our pipeline is available on GitHub. So everything is available. You can check absolutely everything. And that's it.